Are you blessed today? Amen. I'm not so sure about y'all today. Amen. <laughs> I hear that. I am. But you know, sometimes we're so blessed that we don't realize that we're we're standing around and waiting on something we don't need to be waiting on. Uh, so my question to you today and the title of my message is today, what are you waiting for? You know, sometimes we wait unnecessarily for things. And so to prepare you for this, to make you understand how easy it is to wait, in 1968, I was 10 years old. And uh, it was... It was May the 19th, 1968. I know this day real well. I, you'll understand why in just a minute. And it was the, right at the last day of school. It was just before the last day of school. And so my mom had come to pick us up. We lived probably a mile from the school. And it was pouring, I mean, pouring down rain. And we knew that if it rained, mom would come pick us up. And, and we had a brand new 1968 Dodge station wagon. I mean, it was, you know, well, there's eight kids, so there's six kids and two parents, so we needed the station wagon. We had wood grain. Wood grain panel, yes, sir. It was, it was, it was a panel car. I mean, it was, it was and we were, we were, mom come and pick us up. And so I got out, and I, I went to the, the car, and I'm sitting there, and mom says, where's your sister? My sister, Nanda, uh, bless her heart. I love my sister, but she decided it was raining and she took off walking home. I didn't know that at the time. So mom says, go find your sister. So I went to go look for Nana. Well, then it, when I come back to the car, man, it is really raining hard. I mean, it, it's coming down. So I'm running to the car and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm running track and field for the school and everything, you know, fifth grade. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to do I'm going to use this water puddle in front of me for the long jump. Well, there's something I forgot to think about when you're running when it's wet. And you go to jump. There's no traction. So I landed firmly in that water puddle on my elbow. And I could not move my arm. It literally it broke it sitting in this angle like it is right now. And so I told mom, I never got sick or anything, but I, I didn't feel good. She says, well, we're going to have to take you because it won't move. So we went to Fort Gordon. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the old base at Fort Gordon, they had barracks. And the, the hospital was in different buildings, different sections of the hospital. And to go into the pediatric ward, you were in this one building. And then so from pediatrics, they sent me to uh, X-ray, which was in another building that sent me back to pediatrics, uh, who then sent me back to another building which was in uh, specialty uh, to do things. But while we were doing all this back and forth, they, they sent me to x-ray and we're sitting in x-ray and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting for them to call so they can x-ray my arm and see what's going on. So finally, my mom goes up there and says, I want to know what the problem is. We've been sitting here, I forgot, it was probably about an hour, and they said, nobody's called to take x-rays. And the guy behind the desk looks at my mom and says, what's his name? And she says, Milton Paul Moore. And she said, he says, we've been calling for the last 30 minutes. My mother has never called me Milton. She's always called me Paul. We're sitting there, and they're calling Milton Moore to come get x-rays, and neither one of us heard Milton. Now, let me ask you a question. What are you waiting for? God's calling your name. But are you hearing him when he calls your name? See, that's the thing that we've got to look at today. We're going to be in Acts chapter number 22 this morning. Acts chapter 22. We're going to go through a lot of scripture this morning. But the question is, what are you waiting for today? What is it that holds you back from doing what God has called you to do? And we need to look at that. Is he calling your name but you're not hearing him? We need to discover that today. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. If you found your place, let's stand in honor of reading of God's word. Chapter 22. 
in verse 16. It says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning already, because, Lord, we know that our sins are washed away because you looked at each one of us and we accepted you as Lord and Savior, and you said those words that we just sang, not guilty. And what a powerful message that song has to say to us today, because, Lord, even before we knew you, you loved us. So, Lord, may we understand that today you call upon us. And, Lord, we need to get rid of those excuses that we have for not being obedient, not following you, and going the direction you called us to do, and saying, what am I waiting for? And, Lord, may we get rid of those excuses today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know what? I, I hear this all the time. And, and the truth of the matter is, it's just an excuse. So many people say, well, you know, preacher, I'm just waiting until I'm convicted. Convicted of what? What did you do? See, there's no question about being convicted. Folks, you read the Bible, it tells us we're all sinners. So you're convicted right there. There's your conviction. You don't need any more. It tells you in plain black and white that you are convicted, that you are guilty and punishable by death. That's the sentence that's on us if we do not have Jesus Christ. Those are the words of God. But listen to what it says. If anyone will do his will, he knows concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether it speaks of his own authority. What we need to understand is if you're convicted, then you've got, if you say you're not convicted, then you're not reading God's word and realizing that you are convicted. We all are convicted. By reading the word of God, it reveals to us the truth that we're all sinners. That we're all destined to go to hell if it's not for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So if you're waiting on being convicted, if you've read this word, if you've read the words, if you've gone through the plan of salvation, if somebody's read those words to you, God's convicted your heart. You have no excuse for saying, I'm waiting until I'm convicted. You know what I hear that? You ever sit in a court and wait on somebody to say, well, what's, what's the sentence? Well, I'm waiting until I get convicted. Guess what? They're already convicted. They're just waiting on the sentence. The Bible tells us in Romans that the sentence for our sin is death. He says, but the gift of God is the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then another one of the things that I hear from people all the time is, well, you know, preacher, you know, well, you know, I don't want to do that again. I, I got so much in the world. I got so many things I want to enjoy before I, I give up everything I've got. And I'm going to tell you, for those of you who are visiting, whether you realize it or not, the way we're acting this morning, that's actually on our best behavior. <laughs> so if y'all expect we're going to be any different, I'm sorry. We, we actually get worse than what we were this morning. You know why? Because we have the freedom to say, I love you, Lord. Amen. And we sing and we praise God. And we're not afraid to show it. Now, if you're afraid to show that you love the Lord, there's something seriously wrong. There's nothing wrong with expressing it. It doesn't make you any kind of person that makes you obedient. But if you say you, you want to, to enjoy the world before you become a Christian, what does that mean? That means you want to get up the next morning and not remember how you got there. That means you've got things that you want to do that's illegal. And you, you, don't, you don't want to be convicted of because God's... Let me tell you, God can convict you whether you're a Christian or not. It doesn't matter. But the fact of the matter is it says... Think about this. This is in Matthew chapter 8 and verse uh, 36. It says, What? For what shall a prophet a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? What happens if you get everything you want? You get to do everything you want. You die without Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What have you gained? I mean, how much can you amass that you're going to take with you when you die? You know how many times people have been buried with their wealth? And then somebody comes back and they take their wealth up and steals it from their dead body because they're, they didn't take it with them. It's gone. How many people thought they could hoard it? You can't take it with you. So you better be laying up treasures for yourself in heaven because that's where when you get there, it's still there. Because they can't be stolen away from you. And we need to understand that. It says, so what are you waiting? Why, why do you think you got to do certain things? Well, you know, and I hear this often, well, you know, preacher, well, everybody's doing it. Duh. No, they're not. The world wants you to believe that everybody's doing it. The fact of the matter is, if you're a child of God and you're being obedient, you're not doing those things. Because we're not supposed to. Or, well, you know, I, I don't want to be, 
oddball out with my friends. You know, if, if, if I come and I do this, then all my friends, they're going to think, well, man, you're, you're one of them weirdo creature, Christian creatures. We ain't sure what you are anymore. I, I don't want my friends to be freaked out by what I do. You know, they might not like me anymore. So what? You know what? I got a lot of my friends today. Honestly, they think I'm strange. I left making a whole lot more money than I was ever make preaching to be a preacher. And they think it'll never last. Look, honestly, I, all my friends told me, you're not going to let you, you, your, your, your blood is bleeds Kroger blue. I'm telling you, I worked for them for 20 years. I love what I did. And when I left, I left kicking and screaming. But God said, you got to go. I could have waited on my friends. My friends tried to convince me, well, you don't need to do that. They said, just, just think about what people are going to think if you, you go preaching. You're going to be what? You know what? God gives us an answer to that. Listen to what he says when he says about waiting on your friends. He who loves his mother, his father, more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, he tells us that if we love anything more than God, we're not worthy of it. You know what? I love my wife. I love her to death. I'm, I'm telling you what, this year we will celebrate 35 years and I'm tickled to death with that. But you know what? If I don't love God more than I love her, then I can't love her like I should. Do you understand that? If you don't love God more than anything than life itself, then you can't love the people around you like you're supposed to love them because you don't love God first. You know, I used to, I used to when we grew up, somebody finally got it right. I, you driving along, you know, I'm 16 years old, I'm driving along in my, my duster, and, and, and I'm, I'm, there's a car in front of me, it's got a bumper sticker, it says, God is my co-pilot. Folks, that's wrong. God shouldn't be the co-pilot, God ought to be the pilot. I do like this. In case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned. Just so you'll know, if you're, if you're around me, ain't gonna be, I'm leaving. I'm not, I'm not giving any notice, I'm gone. But see, God is my pilot. That's what we're supposed to do. He's the helmsman at the head of the ship. He's the one steering the course that we're supposed to go. And if we're waiting on our friends, guess what we're waiting on? Everything that's wrong. Because we want to have what they've got. And, and he, the one thing, the one of the excuses that I hear so this is my favorite. Well, you know, preacher. I need, I need it. The new people in church, they're just not consistent. They, 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 they need to act more like Christians. And that's when I ask the question, well, what, are that, what, what does that look like? What does it look like to be a Christian? <coughs> well, you know, you're not supposed to have a good time. Where in the Word of God does it tell me I can't have a good time? It doesn't say that. You know what, well, well, preacher, you know, there's a lot of hypocrites in the church. And you know what, I got them mad at me. You know what, I get so tired of hearing that. You know what, there are a lot of hypocrites in the church. And if you come, one more won't matter. Like, well, I'm not a hypocrite. I don't tell a Christian to live like that. I said, let me ask you a question. Have you ever got up and told somebody you're having a good day and you weren't having a good day? Uh, then you're a hypocrite. A hypocrite is telling us one thing and being something else. It's a false front. It's putting a mask on and faking who we are. That's what the word hypocrite means. It means to cover up the real self who we are. Go study what the mask means. You know what? It's, you know, you can't wait on your friends. You can't. It says, here's what it says in the Word of God about that. It says, so each of us shall give account of himself to God. You know what? It doesn't matter what you do. When you're standing before God, and there's two seats that you can stand before God, one is the, the great white throne judgment, and the other one is the beam seat of Christ. Now you've got two choices here. You can stand in front of this one, or you can stand in front of this one, but both of them, you're going to stand in front of God, and you're going to be judged. And guess who's going to be in front of him when you're judged? And, and you're going to be able to put it all on them. Nobody. 
If you're a Christian, you're standing in the beam of of Christ, and Christ is looking at you, and here's the blessed part about it. I might not have been the best Christian in the world, but God is going to look down at me and ask me why I'm worthy, and His Son will say, because He believed in me, and I covered His sins in my blood. Amen. I am redeemed. This guy over here is standing here and says, well, what about you? And Jesus is silent. He says nothing. He says, let's look at your record. And your record is going to be like my friend Steve I told you about. He got judged before Judge Kerr one day, and Judge Kerr says, Steve, I would rather read your record. I'd rather weigh it than read it. Let's, let's measure up how all these things that you did in your life, the good things versus the bad things. He says, this stack over here is all the things that you did wrong that you never asked forgiveness for. And over here is the fact of all the things that you did good. But I wasn't a bad person. But see, the one thing is, it doesn't matter how big the stack is. If this stack is covered by the blood of Christ, guess what? It's gone. It's gone. This stack's huge. You've got Jesus on your side. If you don't have it, guess what? You're going to answer for your sins. Now, I can't lose my rewards in heaven if I'm not faithful. I can't lose my salvation. That's a sure. Jesus Christ says he, nobody can pluck me out of his hand. And that's his word. And that's his promise. So, you know what? Preacher, you know, but, you know I, I just I need to be a better person. You know, I, I, need to, I need to do better. I need to be a better person before I start going to church. Hogwash. You know what? Yesterday, we cleaned this church. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you want to see Greg Cat, give him a new toy. <laughs> give him a pressure washer that's high pressure. And this boy's like a kid in a candy store. Huh? Well, let me tell you. He didn't get one like Lloyd's. It's, you might want to pay for it, but trust me, he was like a kid in a candy store yesterday. He was. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, that has nothing to do with my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It, it, it's just like anything else. We want to give up something. We don't want to give it. You know, I, wait till I get better. You know, wait till I, when I get better. You know, when I, I got to do a few things, I got to get rid of them, and then, then I'll come. God didn't say get better. Listen to what He says in His Word. But I go and. Learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He says, Don't worry about where you're at. I can change you. I can make you what I want you to be. You know, you hear this all the time, but remember this God didn't call the qualified, He qualified to call. He makes us worthy. We don't make ourselves worthy to come to Him. We come to Him and He makes us worthy to be there with Him. When He covers us in His blood, He will change you. He will make you what you ought to be. As I was talking to them in Sunday school and asking them and reminding you, let me tell you, when we get to heaven, who's going to be the most worthy person to sit next to Christ? I've had this discussion with several people, and I shared this with the Sunday school class. You know what? We all think of D.L. Moody, and we think of, of Billy Sunday, and we think of Billy Graham, and we can go on and on. We can think of Charles Haddon Spurgeon or, or <coughs> a number of people that we can name. Just Moses, Abraham, Elijah, Enoch, all these people. You know what? I don't think it's any of them. And I'm going to tell you what I told my Sunday school class this morning. This is who I think is going to be right there next to the Lord. It's that little old lady that nobody thought anything of who was there faithfully. They never heard anything out of her. She was just there every Sunday. God had given her a job. God says, here's my job for you. I want you to pray for the people in the church. And faithfully, every day, she prayed for those people. Every day of her life. She never taught Sunday school. She never sang in the choir. She never did anything but pray. And God's going to look at her and come sit at my right hand. Right here next to my son. Good and thankful, sir. 
you are thankful over a few things. I'm going to thank you, Lord, over many. It's not about what you do. It's about thankfulness of what you do for him. It's being faithful. It's doing what God called you to do. It didn't ask you to be better. He says, I'll make you better. He says, be faithful. Whatever I give you to do, do it well. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, you know, the preacher, you know, I, I think I can, I can hold out a little bit longer. You know what? You know how I know? If I can take you to Sherwood Baptist Church, where I grew up in South Augusta, if the sanctuary was still there, they had burned, and the pews were still up, and the pews were still there, I could probably take you to a few of those pews, and I could show you fingerprints of those pews, people holding on to those pews, waiting. So you know what? I can hold out a little bit longer. I can hold out a little bit longer. Lord, I, 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 I'm going to hold out just a little, little bit longer. I just, I, I'm, just, I'm not ready, Lord. I'm not ready. And finally, when they let that grip go, God says, now nah, I got you. Jude says, now to him that is able to keep you from stumbling and to present your faultless before the presence of the glory of, with exceeding joy. He says, he can make you faultless. He can make you what you ought to be. What does God want you to do today? How does God want to use you today? How does God want to use you in a mighty way? It could be like Tuesday. We got out there and we grilled and we grilled and we grilled and we grilled. I'm going to tell you, I've never seen two better supervisors than Lloyd and Pete. They did an outstanding job of supervising. They put all the Donnie on the grill and they did an awesome job grilling. And, and behind them, uh, John was supervising the two of them to supervise the others. And I stood and said, I went over there and sat down and stayed out of the way. But I'm telling you, you don't know how many times just the, the simple thank you. But man, that was awesome. Because somebody says, well, why are you doing this? Because we wanted to. Nothing more than that. We just wanted to say thank you. It was an awesome day. It was, it was a day when God had said, go and do what I asked you to do. And, and, and my presence will be there. You could feel God's presence with what we were doing that day. And so he says, he will fill you with exceeding joy. And then Thursday, I'm sorry, Friday, no Thursday, I got a phone call and, and they told me that uh, they were, I had gone to see Candace Wednesday and then Thursday I, they said, call me back and said they're going to take the baby Thursday morning. So, And then I called and they said, well, they're not sure they're going to take the baby. So I went ahead and went to the hospital and we're sitting there at the hospital and the doctor comes in and examines Candace and says, we're taking the baby now. Not in a few minutes, now. So uh, Clara was born uh, Thursday morning. Please be a prayer for her. Uh, when she was born, her lungs weren't working. They're fully developed. But she wasn't breathing on her own, so they had to put her on a ventilator. Uh, the doctors have not been positive about any of it, but yesterday they reduced the ventilator from 100% to 80%, and if it gets down to 60%, they, they might start trying to wean her off the ventilator. She's five and a half weeks early. Right. Yeah, 34 and a half weeks is how long, far along she is. But I'll tell you what. You go in there and you go in that neonatal ICU unit, you see this beautiful, beautiful example of what God can do. This little baby. What a precious, precious thing. Now we don't know what the outcome of what's going to happen to that child is. We have no idea. But God is in time, on time, every time. And we don't we don't need to wait on God's time. God's time is right now. Listen to what this word says. For he said, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. That's what the doctor told Candace the other day. Now is the day your baby's going to be born. Now is the day that she's going to come. Folks, today is the day of salvation. There is not another day. There may never, ever be another day for you. This may be your chance. To hear the gospel and believe and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And God may say, I'm done with you. What are you waiting for? What do we wait on today? Why are we so hesitant to do what God asked us to do? Well, we got all kinds of excuses. God gives us a reason why we shouldn't wait on those excuses. And then, you know what? I think my favorite of all the excuses. Well, you know, I'm going to live my life, and just before I die, I'm going to do. 
what God asked me. God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get right with God. God, I, the big man upstairs and I have an understanding. Here's your understanding. If I haven't said this before, I'm going to say it again. It doesn't matter. Here's your understanding. God will tell you that if you don't have Jesus Christ and you die today, you're going to die and go to hell. Period. That's the understanding you have right now with Him. If you want to get to heaven, you've got to believe. You've got to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There is no other way. For He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So there's only one way to get there, and today is the day. And waiting until the day you die is not a good plan. How old are you going to be when you die? Anybody know what day they're going to die? All right. Since you don't know what day, you don't know what hour, then how are you going to wait until just before you die to accept Jesus Christ? Because age, death does not discriminate. It doesn't care how old you are. It doesn't care how young you are. Death takes us all. And as I said before, you know, I don't know anybody that, that's 100 years old that's a member of this church. That means everybody that's been a member of this church that's over 100 years old is dead. But I've also buried babies too. So we don't know. We have no idea. I buried young and I buried old. We do not know when. Listen to what he said. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be restored, and that without remedy. You know, we sing a song that's called There is a Remedy. I love that song. You know why? Because there's a remedy to the problem that you're dealing with today in your life. And that name is Jesus Christ. Today, there's a remedy for whatever you're ailing you. Are you struggling in your life in some capacity, some way? Are you having difficulty with something that you're dealing with? There is a remedy, and its name is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, and I, want, I, I don't want to sugarcoat this for you. You know what? If you walk down the aisle, you don't know Jesus Christ. You walk down the aisle and you say, I want Jesus. And, and I share with you how to be saved. And you come and you ask Jesus into your heart. And you get up. Guess what? You're going to go home, and everything that you've dealt with is still there. But here's the great thing. You're not going to go home alone. Because, see, when you get up, you're going to be taking Jesus home with you. And although your problems are still going to be there, you've got somebody that's your advocate, somebody that's going to be there to help you get through those difficult days. Those uncertain times, those days when, when you don't know about what's going to happen tomorrow, those days when, when there's more questions and you've got answers, when, when you've got a loved one, a baby, a five-pound, eight-ounce baby laying in a, in a, in a bed, with all the things hooked up, with a ventilator, hooked on a ventilator, and you don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. But you know who holds tomorrow, and you know that God is still in control regardless of what happens. That's not easy to do. You know that when you're standing there beside somebody you love so dearly, somebody you don't want to see suffer anymore, but somebody you don't want to see die either, you know that God is in control, that He is the Master. <laughs> And you have that assurance that He knows and He loves you and He's going to take care of you. We serve that kind of God <coughs> that regardless of what it is we deal with, He's also there when you have the opportunity to sit down with a, a young couple and say, you know what? Praise God that you do want to spend the rest of your life together. What a blessing that is to you. What a blessing when, when people want to commit their, their lives to another and surrender their lives to somebody else. To give up who they are. And let me tell you, if you're getting married, you give up who you are to be somebody else with the person you are. You're going to be somebody totally different. Because you're surrendering, saying, I surrender myself to this one I love. Well, when you give yourself to God, you do the same thing. Say, I'm surrendering to the one to one I love that loves me first. And that's Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation. What's your excuse to that? Let me tell you, I can go through this word and I can show you answers to every one of the excuses you've got for not accepting Jesus Christ. It's right here in black and white. You want an answer? It's right here. Here's the answer. If you don't have Jesus Christ today, when you walk out of this door, you don't know you're going to go to heaven. Guess what? You're in trouble. 
Because you can't stand before the master on that day of judgment and say, well, I never heard that I had to believe. I never heard that I had to believe that Jesus died on the cross. I never heard. And God's going to replay this day for you. He's going to say, guess what? On, on August the 3rd, 2014, you sat at Elam Egypt Baptist Church. And the preacher stood there and proclaimed, Thus saith the Lord, that you have, there's only one way to heaven, and it's Jesus Christ. And you walked out the door and said, I've got plenty of time. And God's going to look at you and say, You didn't have time. That was your chance. I don't want that to be any of you. I want every one of you, if you, know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that God calls you to be a part of His family. He also calls us, if we're children of God, if we're servants, then He calls us to be workers, not spectators. That's not, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be workers in the church. You know, we, we had a group of people here working yesterday. Well, actually, we stood, some of us stood and watched Lloyd work most of the day. Greg got hold of the thing and we watched Greg work. And the ladies were busy inside cleaning up and everything, so I, I came in and watched them work. I'm a good supervisor. I, you know what I learned how to do yesterday? I learned how to turn a compressor on and off so the water could go through the machine. I turned it up and turned it down. That's my job yesterday. And then I left it and let somebody else do it. God is good. I appreciate the people that did it. But God's got a job for you. It's not just sitting <coughs> in your seat. I'm excited because we serve an awesome God. Now, what are you going to do? Whatever God has called you to do, you be faithful to give the very best that you've got at whatever it is. Whether it's here or somewhere else, you go and you do what God called you to do. And don't shirk on your responsibility. And if God just told you, you pray for these people every day. Then you pray for the people every day. If God called you and said, I want you to teach, you teach. If he says, I want you to sing the choir, you sing the choir. If he says, I want you to be involved in whatever, working with the youth or working with the children or, or whatever it might be. You do what God calls you to do. And do it faithfully. And do it unapologetically. Say, you know what? This is what God called me to do. I'm going to be the best I can at this. If God called me to wash dishes, I'm going to be the best dishwasher I've got. John has proved that to me. I appreciate that. He's a good dishwasher. You need dishes washed? Just call John. He'll come wash it for you. Y'all think I'm kidding, don't you? We serve an awesome God. But you know what? When we see what God has for us to do, we do the best of our ability. We do it. Whether it's cleaning the outside of the church or it's cleaning the inside of the church or whatever we do, go and share the gospel. And somebody says, why do you do this? Because we serve a God who loved us first. So whatever it is that God's got for you to do, do it faithfully. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for this day and this hour that we have as we come before you. And Lord, that we will be faithful to your word. That Lord, if there's one here today that has not accepted you as Lord and Savior, that they won't hesitate. They will walk down this aisle and say, I need Jesus. Not because I have said anything to them, but Lord, because of the conviction of their heart. Because your Holy Spirit is, is stirring them up, Lord, that they will, they will answer that call. Because, Lord, we don't want anybody to be lost. But we want all to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And, Lord, there may be some here today that are not being faithful to service like you called them to be. And Lord, may, may they answer that call. Set aside everything that's in their life and everything that pulls them away and say, you know what? I have a job to do now. I need to do it faithfully. Whatever it might be. But Lord, may we all be submissive to your spirit in our life. And it's in Jesus' name.